Live from the John F. Kennedy Institute of Politics at Harvard University, Hardball's Battle for the White House. Tonight, our series of interviews with the Democratic candidates for president continues. Here's Chris Matthews. For the next hour, he's trying to be the first general to win the presidency since Dwight D. Eisenhower. Our guest tonight, General Wesley Clark. Let's play hardball. General, after that incredible warm welcome and your campaigning through the room here so illustriously, I cannot resist. I cannot resist. What does it feel like to visit the John F. Kennedy Institute of Politics for a guy who voted for Richard Nixon twice? <laughs> great question. Listen. It is a great question. Why, why did, what did you see, given your no, values, no, wait, no, wait. in, in Richard gonna, Nixon and answer, Spiro Agnew? What did I you see in these answer guys? answer the question you asked me. Okay. <laughs> Nixon, I was in Little Rock, Arkansas. Right. And um, I decided I'd go to West Point. I went over, it was right after the Berlin crisis. It was right after Kennedy had given the speech, asked not what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country. I went over and I took my entrance exam for West Point. I started with an interview with the Arkansas Army National Guard. They were mobilized to go to Berlin. I took the physical fitness exam at Fort Leonard Wood, Missouri in February of 62. And I went in with 806 other young men from across the United States and John Kennedy was president. And it felt wonderful and it feels great to be here today. And then you voted for Nixon. <laughs> <laughs> Why? Ken Kennedy wasn't there. Okay, you voted for Nixon twice and Reagan twice. Why are you now running as a Democrat? because I believe in what the Democratic Party stands for. I believe in, I voted for people who were strong on national security and national defense, but we're in a different era. And what this country needs is effective leadership. And it needs a party that engages abroad, not uses force abroad necessarily, but engages abroad. And it needs a party at home that lifts people up, mm. not leaves them behind and the right party is the Democratic Party. Why do you think the titular head of the Democratic Party, the man who ran for president this past time and won more votes, 600,000 more votes than the current president, why do you think he endorsed Howard Dean today? I have no idea, but I'll tell you this, Chris, I don't pay any attention to endorsements unless they're for me. <laughs> I don't think the country is looking for politicians. Right. What they're looking for are real people and real leaders at this point in American history. And that's what I'm sensing out there when I talk to people on the campaign trail. Let me ask you about the, the, the leadership of the Democratic Party. Uh, Bill Clinton uh, has a lot of his people working in your campaign. Eli Siegel is here today, a great man. Uh, Mickey Kennedy. There he is. Harry, Harry Tomlinson, a lot of people from that campaign. Chris Lahane, uh, a lot of Clinton people have come to work for you. Is that, a, is that a signal that you're the Clinton favorite? 
Well, I haven't, I haven't ever asked that question, and I wouldn't ask that question. President Clinton's the leader of the party. He's the, he's, he's the real leader. He's the intellectual force behind the party. He's the man who created 22 million jobs during his administration. Was he a good president? Absolutely. He's one of the greatest American presidents. We, he's Was one he of better the than Reagan? Ever <laughs> Was he better than Reagan? Was he better than Reagan? Of better than Nixon? Of course. Better than both those guys, okay. Sure. But he wasn't running against them. Okay. <laughs> Let me ask you about, has Clinton given you any advice, sort of in the middle of the night he calls you because he stays up late? Has he ever called you and said, uh, uh, General, I got some great ideas for you. You got to work this guy, Dean, a little different. He's ever given that Dutch uncle stuff? No, he I... just told me to watch out for Chris Matthews. No, he... <laughs> didn't work for him. Uh, let me ask you. Uh... I think it worked pretty well for him, actually. <laughs> let me ask you about Hillary Rodham Clinton. Do you take her advice? Absolutely. She's Why would you take the advice smart. of a person who wants to be president rather than you? I like Hillary. I've known but her for a long time. But she wants to be president, time. doesn't she? Listen. Everybody has many, many different motives. And I think that most Democrats, most of all, want the man in the White House out. I certainly do. If, um, if a Democrat goes into the White House after this election, and holds the usual two terms. Hillary, as, as Bill Sapphire said today in his column, by the time Hillary gets to run for president, she'll be taking Medicare. So why would she want you to win? Do you really believe she's rooting for you? Listen, I think that she Do you think she she's wants, rooting for any Democrat? I think she wants George Bush out of the White House because it's best for this country. And I Even think if it means she's put Democrat out, she'll never does. get in. Even if it means she'll never get in. I think, you know, I think you're going to somebody's sort of inner motivation yeah. But I believe that people in this country are, especially people who've given their lives in public service, are patriotic. They are essentially selfless. Let me tell you something. The Clintons are Nobody selfless. Takes, the Clintons are selfless? Let me tell you something, Chris. You gotta let me be tell you something. Do you mean Nobody that? takes the abuse in public service unless yeah. it's for some higher calling. Okay. I know that. Right. I can tell you that. Okay. You do this because you believe in this country. That's why you do it. Okay. So, um, wanna, and, and I want, wait a minute, I want to finish my point, okay? Because a lot of people in this country who aren't engaged in the political process, they may not see it that way. I didn't see it for years because right. when I was in the United States Army, I couldn't see people who were out doing the work of politics. Across this country, there are hundreds of thousands of people who give up their nights and their weekends. They stuff envelopes. They go door to door. They don't get any money for it. They don't get any recognition for it. They just believe in this country. In New Hampshire today, there are voters there who are coming and giving up their lunch hours and their evenings just to listen to candidates talk. They're not doing it because it's so entertaining although it might be. Right. But they're really doing it because they have a responsibility and they know it. And this country runs on patriotic energy. It does. A lot of people aren't engaged in that. I wish we'd get 100% turnout for elections. I wish every American would vote. Let me ask and you, I wish every young person in this country would vote. This battle may vote. come down to a battle. I don't know what general, if you watch the polls, but a lot of us do watch the polls, and they see Dean doing very well, but they see you creeping up. They see you maybe moving up to pass John Kerry, the senator from this state, in the New Hampshire primary. You were only two points back the last poll. That means you may already be ahead of him. What is the advantage in the voters selecting you, a man who's had all this military experience, in fact, you were Supreme Commander of NATO, and a man who, who made an effort to avoid the draft? What's the advantage in you over him? Now that's a loaded question, isn't well, it? Well, that's why I gave it to you, because I'm trying to be nice to you now, all right? <laughs> You've always been nice to me, and I've always appreciated coming on your show. I'm not always Chris. nice. I, I just, you know, it's called a gopher pitch. I've thrown a gopher pitch right across the plate. Now right. hit the home run. It's like a... It's like, <laughs> listen, if, if you want a lawyer to lead this country, pick a lawyer. If you're looking for a doctor, get a doctor. But if you want a leader, somebody who's actually been there, who's helped negotiate agreements, who's led an alliance in war, then get a leader. And I'm the only person on that stage of candidates who's ever laid awake at night 
and prayed that the bombs I ordered dropped would hit the right target and not innocent people. And I think you need in this time in this country someone who's done it both at home and abroad. That's why I'm running. I'm the only person who's been there and actually Is done that it. a better standard of leadership than being elected? I mean, in a, demo in a democracy, is a person who's had a history of being elected to public office inferior to a person who's been appointed to high military position? No, but I think you have to look at, at what the real qualifications are. I think being elected public office is a wonderful thing, and I admire every American who's ever stood for elective office. I think it takes a lot of courage for people, especially people who are running for lower level offices because it's their own friends and neighbors that they right. have to really go to and really work, and they're gonna have to live with these people all their lives afterwards. So like one politician told me, he said, be careful when you run because it can cost you everything when you run. And people in elective politics know it. But I think this country right now needs a leader who's more experienced in leading and less experienced in raising money. Hmm. Okay. Let me just finish it. That's a partial answer, okay? I want to come back on it. Well, we have an hour to go. It doesn't take, it, running for office is different than governing. Running for office, is a, it's an art form. It's developed. And I'm doing it for the first time here. And it's been a lot of fun. It's been a real learning experience. And, and I, I've enjoyed it tremendously. But leadership, working with heads of state, thinking about strategies, talking to members of Congress, working with people, that's something I've done for years and years and years. And I'm the only person in the race who's done it and had the practical leadership experience. It's really up to the people in the country to decide what they want in a candidate. And I think Americans needed a choice, and that's why I'm running. First questions are up top. General Clark, you've criticized Bush for his unilater unilateral actions in dealing with Iraq. Right. However, if you were in Bush's shoes right now, what would you be doing differently to rebuild those international bridges you believe have been compromised? Well, if I were president right now, I would be doing things that George Bush can't do right now because he's already compromised those international bridges. I'd go to Europe and I'd build a new Atlantic Charter. I'd say to the Europeans, you know, we've had our differences over the years, but we need you. The real foundation for peace and stability in the world is the Transatlantic Alliance. And I would say to the Europeans, I pledge to you as the American president that we'll consult with you first. You get the right of first refusal on the security concerns that we have. We'll bring you in, and in return, we want the same right on your concer security concerns. And that would reinvigorate NATO. We then put the foundation in place to have a real transatlantic agreement. And working with our allies in Europe, we can move the world. We're 600, 700 million people. We're three permanent seats on the Security Council. We're half the world's GDP. We can do it, whether it's dealing with North Korea, the value of the Chinese currency, or the problems of nuclear developments in Iran. And so that's the essential first step. George Bush cannot do it. He's compromised those ties. It starts with personal respect. He doesn't have it. He's forfeited it. I do. Coming back with more questions on Iraq, we're talking about Wesley Clark, the John F. Kennedy Institute of Politics at Harvard University. Stay with us.
Uh, General Wesley Clark, by the way, General, packed house tonight. Big house tonight, the biggest this room. It's just seizing with activity in here. Uh, <laughs> you know, you said something very interesting uh, in the, uh, about what happened after we were hit on 9-11, 2001, about how you got the word somewhere in the Pentagon or elsewhere that uh, there were people already pushing for war with Iraq. Tell us about that. What the first, because it tells us, I think, about the mindset of this administration mm -hmm. going into 9/11. Well, I went through the halls of the Pentagon. I'd only, it must have been within a couple of weeks after 9/11, and um, I'd been on CNN almost every day. I'd been down in Atlanta and so forth, and I still felt like a military guy. I still, you know, looked at my sleeve. I wanted that big black stripe for general officer on there, and it felt funny because the people, everybody that was going to be engaged in it, of course, I'd worked with them all. So I went through the Pentagon, I just kind of wanted to check in and make sure the stuff I was saying was about right in terms of what they could tell me about the intel and about their perceptions and so forth. I didn't want to divulge any classified information, but just to sort of calibrate. And um, so I went in to see Secretary Rumsfeld and Paul Wolfowitz was there. Then I went downstairs and a guy said, sir, come in here. And uh, I said, I don't want to take up your time. He says, no, you need to hear this. He said, have you heard the joke? I said, uh, no, I haven't. What joke? He said. 9-11, Saddam Hussein, if he didn't do it, too bad, he should have, because we're going to get him anyway. Of course, it wasn't a joke. It wasn't funny. And he didn't tell it to me to make me laugh. Right. He was telling me that there was something seriously amiss in the way the administration was approaching the problem of dealing with terrorism. Why did this administration build the case for war with Iraq after 9-11? What do you think was their motive? I think it's, you know, we really need to ask that question, and we really should have a set of hearings and demand that the administration produce the answers. I don't know. I mean, I wasn't in on the councils of state. It could, it's speculation, but I'll speculate. There were some people who believed that it was essential to just have a strong show of U.S. force. There were others who believed, I guess, that you couldn't expect to be successful against Osama bin Laden, so you had to take down somebody that you could be successful against. There were some who believed in this greater geostrategic vision that you could kind of sweep through the Middle East, clean up these old, worn out, former Soviet client states, knock them off, get into democracy, and, and, and have it all set so the next peer competitor that came down sure. would have to face. And there were even those who made the argument that the real way to bring peace between Israel and the Palestinians was to go after Saddam Hussein. This was the sort of road to Jerusalem runs through Baghdad argument. It was a whole variety. But not then, one of those motives was openly expressed by this administration. No. And, you know, what was expressed was a sort of least common denominator. Let's go after the weapons of mass destruction. We've already got a U.N. mandate to use against Saddam Hussein. He's probably in violation of it. But um, I'd seen some of that intelligence. Several members here in the audience have seen that intelligence. I always believe that he had withheld something from the yeah. inspectors. I mean, he's a cunning guy, and there was no reason to think that he wouldn't have tried to keep some material back. What do you think of the vice but president's story? There's a story in Newsweek this week in Periscope. It just broke today. That the vice president's office was developing intel to justify the war outside the CIA, outside defense intelligence. They had their own sources in the Iraqi National Congress, and they were pushing this stuff uh, right through the office there. Do you, if you had a vice president, if you get elected, are you going to allow a vice president of a separate intelligence operation, a separate operation to justify a war? Absolutely not. Do you think this, do you think this vice president has gotten... Uh, do you think this vice president has gotten an extra constitutional role going right here now? Well, I, I think it's, it's the kind of... Bob Graham said, if you take the country to war improperly, it's an impeachable offense. And what we've had here, it's very hard for the American people to come to terms with this. But let me put it in very stark, clear terms. <clears throat> when this administration came to office, they were advised that the greatest threat to American security was Osama bin Laden. Yet almost nine months later, there was no plan to deal with Osama bin Laden. Yet there, had, there were plans to start national missile defense and a lot of other things, but not to deal with the greatest threat. And then, after 9-11, there was this massive bait-and-switch operation. I think they made the decision to go after Saddam and worked very hard to try to find the evidence to justify it, but they failed. That evidence is not there. It was not there. It was the wrong war. It was an unnecessary war, and it's a $150 billion mess today.
-hmm. Thank you very much. Thanks for coming to Wesley Park after this break. Stay with us. Only 12 presidents did not serve in the military. Three rose to the highest rank of five-star general, Washington, Grant, and Eisenhower. You're watching Hardball's Battle for the White House. went to break, you made, I thought, a stunning statement about the use of uh, intel by the president, the vice president, this administration generally, that justified us going to war, not under the pretext that they gave the American people, but under another set of motives, using, well, do you think they used suspect evidence to make the case? Well, I think they used evidence that wasn't properly, let's say, vetted by right. the intelligence community. And you know, was we it recklessly used? Were well, they using evidence? Of course it's reckless, Chris. Look, anytime you're dealing in the intelligence business, you're getting information that you have to fully right. vet. Everybody who gives information has a motive. It may be money, exactly. it may be revenge, it may be they want back in power. And nobody had more motives to get us back into Iraq than the Iraqi National Congress. Who's, your, who's, who's guilty here, the president or the vice president who, of using this inadequate intelligence to justify a war? Harry Truman said, the buck stops here. This is the responsibility of the President of the United okay, States, right and we can't duck it. We're right back to General Wesley Clark, stay with us.
Hello, I'm Christy Muzumeci at half past the hour. Here are the headlines. The verdict is in, announced a short time ago. South Dakota Congressman Bill Janklow was found guilty of manslaughter and all other charges stemming from a crash last August that killed a motorcyclist. Janklow now faces up to 10 years in prison and possible expulsion from the House of Representatives. A bombshell development in the race for the Democratic presidential nomination. NBC News confirms former Vice President Al Gore will endorse Howard Dean for the nomination tomorrow morning in New York City. The two will then travel to Iowa to campaign. Gore is endorsing Dean over his 2000 running mate, Senator Joe Lieberman. And the Associated Press reports a knife and blood matching Drew Shodin's blood type were found in the car belonging to her accused kidnapper. Alfonso Rodriguez, a convicted rapist, was arrested last week. The University of North Dakota student was last seen November 22nd. A search continues for her. Those are your headlines. Back to Hardball with Chris Matthews. failed to note the irony in that news report. Uh, he's going to get 10 years in prison, and they may even kick him out of the House of Representatives. <laughs> Give it a comment. He's going to have to use a lot of absentee ballots if they don't. <laughs> okay, let's go to Bonnie Newman. For the, for the Welcome. Faculty. If you were elected, how would you keep American jobs from going offshore without violating free trade agreements? Well, I think what we first would have to do is we have to make sure in our own tax code that we're not incentivizing the export of jobs. So we've got to go back through all the items in the tax code and make sure the companies that are putting their headquarters out there or taking jobs away from the United States are not being rewarded for it from the government. And then on the other side of it, we need to reward companies that are adding jobs in America. And then we need to take other broader measures. We're going to have a $100 billion jobs bill in America to restart this economy and really make job growth real. We're going to work hard on science and technology so we invest in the right research and development to create the leading edge technologies that will give us things that only we can manufacture in the years ahead. So it's a multi-part program. But my number one domestic priority is jobs. And we will work on that from day one. Let me, uh, General, do you think Osama bin Laden, if we catch him, when we catch him, should be tried here in the US or at The Hague, the International Court? Well, I'd like to see him tried in The Hague, and I'll tell you why. Because I think it's very important for U.S. legitimacy and for building other support in the world on terror, in the war on terror, to try him in The Hague under international law with an international group of justices, bringing in witnesses from other nations. Remember, 80 some odd nations lost citizens in that strike on the World Trade Center. It was a crime against humanity and he needs to be tried in international court Well, 3,000 Americans were killed here. Do you uh, believe that, um, do you believe he should be held exempt from capital punishment? Because if you send him to Hague, he will be. They well, I think that's a separate issue. I think no, that's it's a, a key issue. issue because the sentencing no. limitation there, they do not execute people at the Hague. I think that you can adequately punish Osama bin Laden, and you've got to look beyond simple retribution against an individual. You've got to look for what's in the long-term security interest of the United States of America. And you've got to look at how we're going to handle the war on terror from here on out. Well, doesn't life in Holland beat living in a cave? <laughs> Not in a Dutch prison. Chris, they're underwater, they're damp, they're cold, they're really miserable. Uh, let's go upstairs. Let's go. Sir, during the past week, Governor Dean has discussed information being leaked to the internet by conspiracy theorists, that President Bush was tipped off by the Saudis to 9-11, yet did nothing. What do you think about Governor Dean's comments? Well, I wouldn't make comments like that, because I think when you've been on the inside of the intelligence community and national leadership, you recognize that, that that's just a very, 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 very low likelihood of ever having happened. I mean, it just doesn't work that way. Let's take a look at what uh, General Schwarzkopf said about you, General. This was on our show recently. Yeah, I didn't get to see this. Well, you will now. <laughs> 
he was fired because of matters of character and integrity. That is a very, very damning statement, uh, which says if, if that's the case, uh, he's not the right man for president as far as I'm concerned. Well, response? Well, I think you cut off the first part of it, which is, it's first of all, from him, it's hearsay. He's quoting another officer who says that that's why I was fired. And he said, if that's the case. Well, it's not the case. I wasn't fired for reasons of character and integrity. In fact, according to the statements of Secretary Cohen, Hugh Shelton, and everybody else, I wasn't fired at all. What we actually well, why did he had... Say, why did Schwarzkopf <clears throat> say that? I have no idea. But uh, I'll tell you what we really did have, Chris, is we really had a policy dispute. We had a policy dispute in which one group of officers in the Pentagon working with the Republican-dominated Congress didn't believe that the United States should act to prevent another war in the Balkans with another round of ethnic cleansing. But it was my area of responsibility, and it was my duty to warn the Pentagon and uh, the entire U.S. government and NATO about the dangers ahead. I took my responsibility seriously. I gave those warnings. I recommended a policy be adopted. It was adopted. The Pentagon had the chance to block that policy. It chose not to. And when diplomacy failed, we went to war. And it was my responsibility to hold NATO mm -hmm. together and put the strategy in place. And I believe that when you commit American soldiers to combat, or airmen, or sailors, or Marines, once you commit this country's forces to war, and the prestige of this country, and all of the moral authority of this country, you must succeed. And I pushed very hard to make sure we did. And there were some people who didn't like that. But I think my judgment is validated by the fact that today, one and a half million Albanians are back in their homes. And Kosovo is a place of peace. That was achieved through leadership. This well, is a comment about my leadership, and I think my leadership is judgment did, did by Bill, the events. Did Bill Clinton agree with your policy? Absolutely. Well, why did he relieve you? Well, first of all, I wasn't relieved. And you weren't? No. Uh-uh. <laughs> you weren't relieved the Supreme Commander of NATO? <clears throat> no, I wasn't. No. I was asked to retire three months early. How's that different? Because <laughs> the way it works, <clears throat> weren't if you, you hurt are relieved, by that? Weren't you hurt by the president whose policies you supported against the opinions of other high-ranking military people that he would... That he would undercut you after you supported him against these other fellows? Well, but you have to let me answer the sure, first question you asked. Go for it. If you relieve someone, you take them out of command. What happened here was I was asked to retire early, and it was then leaked to the Washington Post in an effort to keep me from talking to Bill Clinton about it. So this was a behind-the-back power play. Bill Clinton told me himself he had nothing to do with it, and I believe him. And why do you believe him? Why do I believe him? Because he's the commander in chief and he would not have done this this way. This undercut the ability of the Democratic administration to claim credit for success in the Balkans. And the first thing that happened to Bill Clinton when he went to overseas four days after it was announced was everybody said, why'd you fire the commander who won the war? And he stood up there again and again and said, he wasn't fired, he wasn't fired, he wasn't fired. Have you ever read the statements that Bill Cohen made on my retirement? Have you looked at how he praised me and said I was a great leader? Why do you think all this is happening now? Well, why it's did one word, Chris. One word. It's a word you're not unfamiliar with. Politics. <laughs> well, let me, let me ask you. <laughs> you were relieved. Chris, 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 yeah, this is a very Chris, important thing. Now, wait a minute. I was not relieved, okay? You, you were asked now, to retire was, early. Yes. Who asked you? Um, actually, Hugh Shelton called me. I was in dinner with the president of Lithuania. And what was your reaction on t being told to retire three months early? I said, well, well, why? And he said? He gave me a couple of phony reasons. Were you angry with him? I said, can we talk about this? He said, uh, no, I have to tell Secretary Cohen right away that I've told you. So Cohen told Shelton to tell so you? So I then went back in and finished the dinner with the president of Lithuania. It was a really cheery evening. <laughs> and uh, when I came back and I got on the phone back in the hotel there in, in Vilnius and I had my, uh, secu my secure communications guy, said, I said, I want to speak to General Shelton. He said, uh, sir, there's a Mr. Graham on the phone. 
And I was thinking, Bob Graham, Bob Graham. I said, what's his first name? He said, well, I don't know. Do you want me to ask? He said, no, no, put him through. I thought it was Senator Graham. He said, uh, generally says, uh, this is Bradley Graham from the Washington sure. Post. He said, and we have an official authorized Pentagon news leak that you'll be replaced <laughs> by, he said, and I'd just like to ask you, um, when were you consulted with this and what's your view on it? And I said, well, Brad, I wasn't consulted. I was informed about 45 minutes ago and um, you don't want my view right now. <laughs> And but so, you weren't fired. No. <laughs> well, it sounds like it. No. You were told it's, to leave. It's, and I just want to ask you, why do you trust the president? Because the president heard about this. He must have read the news reports that you were that you had been asked to retire three months early. And he didn't lift a finger to keep you in the post when you had fought the war for him and won it. Isn't that shocking to you and, dis and disappointing that the, that the commander in chief you served so nobly and victoriously allowed you to be asked to be retired three months early and didn't lift a finger to help you? And now you say such glowing things about this man. Well, let's go back into the story a little bit more, okay. Chris. Sure. Because this is a, a night that's sort of indelible in my mind. I would mind. expect. <laughs> what did you but feel towards Bill I Clinton as you were going to bed that night and you had your head on the pillow? I want to should ask your wife, Gert, by the way. Uh, but what were you saying? That I just love that Bill Clinton. He, I won that war for him, and here's how he thanks me? Well, as a matter of fact, the first person to talk to, of course, was Hugh Shelton. Yeah. And the second person was Bill Cohen to talk to. What do you feel about him? So, um, so I called Hugh, and he was in a meeting, and he couldn't take the call. Yeah. And, um, and then I called for, for Secretary Cohen. Of course, he was in Japan. They and, have phones in Japan. And um, <laughs> he was busy preparing for an important meeting. Okay. So we had a little problem getting through. You said um, a while ago. Finally, I got through. Right. And I said to Hugh, I said, you know, this is, this, is gonna, this is a mistake. I said, you don't have to do this. I said, I can't understand why you're doing it. But you know this is going to backfire on you. And it's going to make the United States look bad and look screwed right. up. And it's going to look like all the frictions that were there during the war the frictions that Norm Schwarzkopf had with Colin Powell were identical frictions. I mean, it's the difference between the, cons the perspective of a guy in the field and people in the Pentagon. You always have it in every war. And I said, all that's going to come out. It's going to make you look bad. He said, I'll, uh, you know, he said, I I'll check with, and I'll, I'll check with our public affairs guy. You know, you've got to, he called me back about five minutes. Says, he said, you know, he said, I'm really sorry, but, uh, but the paperwork's already been sent up to the Senate on this. Okay, well, it and sounds like you said the buck stops here with the president in another matter tonight, but it seems like in this case you don't think the buck stops with the president. You don't hold Bill Clinton responsible for asking you to retire three months early. Well, he could have, he could have reversed it right. after it was public. Right. But I guess his judgment was that that would in turn undercut the Secretary right. of Defense. And He'd rather undercut you, the guy that helped him win the war. The Secretary of Defense is, um, it's, he's, he's his number two in the I National Command Authority. Can we come back and talk more about this? Or well, something else if you'd like. I want to talk about what's important to this country. Okay, let's come back and we'll talk about this that. this is not important okay, to Okay, this country. is not important. We'll come back and talk about something important to the general. Come to hardball.msnbc.com.
General Wesley Clark. By the way, uh, in the middle of the audience is uh, the General's wife, wonderful wife, Gerd. There she is, right in the middle. And there, my wife is on her right. <laughs> Although she may be on her left for all we know. Uh, let me ask you about, since we brought up marriage here, uh, on gay marriage, I asked you a couple weeks ago about this. It's a domestic issue. You want to talk about domestic issues? You're going to go back to gay marriage I just marriage want to again? ask you if, if, if you believe that gay people should be out, able to have marriages or, or something else. I think they should have exactly the same rights that every other American has. Should they get a marriage license? Should they get a marriage license? Here in Massachusetts, You're talking about the Supreme Court specific... of this state has specifically said that the legislature, as we call the great and general court of this state, is required, mandated by the courts under the Constitution of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts to write legislation allowing gay couples to apply for and receive marriage licenses. What is your opinion on that, General? My opinion is that I was ready to answer the question before you ask it a second time. Okay. <laughs> I want to get more questions in here. Now, on, on gay marriage, I think that, that gays and lesbian couples need exactly the same rights as every other American, the right of joint domicile, survivorship, inheritance, putting people on the same insurance policies. But the, but the word marriage, but equal? the word marriage, right. that's up to the church, the synagogue, the mosque, and it's up to the state legislatures. So I'm in favor of civil unions. But about civil I think marriage? Civil unions is the term, and then it's up to the states and the churches to whether they label that a marriage. So you don't have I an think opinion. the issue is equal do rights under law. Civil marriage or not? Equal rights under law. Separate but equal? Equal rights <laughs> under law. Separate but equal. Equal rights under law. Okay, that's your position. Let me ask you about a couple of things, because you've said that you like the domestic policies, I think, of, uh, of President Clinton. Would you have signed the 1996 Welfare Reform Act? Yes, I would. Would you have signed the 1996 Defense of Marriage Act? I'm not familiar with all the details of that act. The detail says that states can reject marriage licenses issued for gay couples. Well, I don't believe that that's the right way to proceed right now. I think we've got a new set of issues. I think we need to take a look at it okay. after the last Supreme Court ruling and after this so decision So you and Bill Clinton are growing apart. Well, I think Bill Clinton is, is growing also. Okay. Would you have supported the 1998 Iraq Liberation Act? Um, I probably would not have supported that act. I remember telling at the time to Madeleine Albright, I remember telling her in this fall of 98, and I said, uh, Madam Secretary, I said, you know, your real problem that's coming is not in Iraq. It's in Europe. But this, um, this project for a new American century yeah. started this movement to use force against Iraq in an effort to make the Clinton administration look weak. They built a case that the Clinton administration couldn't hand handle international affairs. It's exactly the same kind of movement that went against President Carter 20 years ago in the Committee on the Present Danger that had to do with the SALT Treaty. Would but that, in this would case, that it was push directed war with against Iraq, Iraq. Would they have pushed war with Iraq and perhaps gotten us into war with Iraq irregardless of 9-11? If there hadn't been a 9-11? I think they would have the looked for a for the, way to get us back into Iraq. I went back to President Bush's, or yeah, then Governor Bush's, second debate with Al Gore. And in it, he said he doesn't believe in nation keeping. He believe or nation building or peacekeeping. He believes U.S. military forces should be used to quote, you know, take out a dictator when it's in our interest to do so. What dictator could he have been talking about but Saddam Hussein? This was a sort of basic logic behind the Republican Party, that wing of the Republican Party. I think they came into office looking for the opportunity, not quite sure how to get it. And 9/11, presto. Perfect okay. opportunity. Thank you very much, Senator Wesley Clark. Back in a moment with more questions.
John White was uh, John White's on the faculty here. He said he was Deputy Secretary of Defense in the Clinton administration. John, thanks. Wes, we have a huge trade deficit, a growing budget deficit, and a zero savings rate. And if you were president, what would you do about these problems? Well, Mr. Secretary, sir, John was my boss. <laughs> but we never got to talk economics. <laughs> what we need to do is we need to restore fiscal responsibility in this country. And it starts really with going back to the Bush tax cuts. We need to bring back from the wealthiest Americans, those making 200000 a year and above, the tax cuts that, that President Bush gave them. It, we didn't have the money. They could have called those tax cuts for wealthy Americans theft if it hadn't been signed into law. Because we're borrowing money from our children. We're giving the notes to the Chinese and the Japanese, and we're giving it to wealthy Americans to buy stock and homes in Aspen and other places. It's not money that's being spent for the best future of America. So that's the number one thing to do, is restore some fiscal responsibility in this country. And I will do that. Thank you. General, what's your, uh, on a lighter note, we've done this for all the candidates every Monday night. Favorite book? Yours. Well, I like... Pat Conroy's great Santini. Oh, great. Oh, I did. Okay, great. <laughs> Favorite movie? Um, uh, well, I mean, we like uh, Dr. Zhivago. I mean, if you look at all the things we've seen, I guess Dr. Zhivago is, of all the things we've what, seen. you got a mouse in your pocket? <laughs> we got, <laughs> Just no, I've got my wife over it's here. It's an old joke. A friend of mine, I'm sorry, I take it back. You say, we, you know, you, you, the longer you've been married, the more you say we. I know that. Okay. Favorite <laughs> philosopher. Favorite philosopher. I used to teach it. I like them all, but, but Plato, obviously. But I did a lot with David Hume. All right. <laughs> favorite, uh, favorite music, piece of music or uh, star? Fifth Symphony, Beethoven. Dun, 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 dun. Favorite military assignment? This is unique to you. <laughs> National Training Center, Fort Irwin, California. What would be your rule about picking federal judges, Supreme Court nominees especially? Do you have any particular thoughts about that? Well, they've got, I don't believe in litmus tests, but they must continue to advance the causes that have already been enshrined in law. I believe in Roe v. Wade, and I believe in affirmative action. Thank you. Affirmative action. Okay, let me uh, thank, uh, I've got to thank Larry Summers, the president of Harvard. I've got to thank Dean Joe Nye, who's been kind enough to come every week. Thank you, Dean. I want to thank Dan Glickman, a great U.S. congressman, now a great head of the Kennedy Institute here at Harvard. Thank you, students, by the way. You're so well behaved. I mean... <laughs> And you're, and you're not, and the crew here, and everybody has put, made to put this incredible scene together. Look, I've said before, it looks like a, like a 19th century cockfight in a bad neighborhood. I love this place. <laughs> anyway, thank you all for being here. Thanks to everybody who's produced the show. And we're going to come up, by the way, Jimmy Carter is coming on the show tomorrow night. My old boss, Jimmy Carter. Fight harder. We'll be right back tomorrow night.